the Billboard charts. I don't really care about them. I mean, of course I don't. I'm a rock guy. Most of the best music that comes from my favorite genres tends to get overlooked or straight up ignored. And the stuff that is rewarded with chart success? Yeah. No one would say McDonald's is a fine restaurant, but you know, those millions and millions served keep showing up every day, so at least financially it's considered a success. And the Billboard charts, well, for what they are, they do work kind of the same way. And well, speaking as someone who doesn't want to eat McDonald's every day, yeah, I tend not to take much interest in them, though they can be interesting from like an archaeological perspective, if you kind of get my drift here. And the rock charts are an especially interesting case because unlike the pop charts, even fewer people care about them. If the pop charts are McDonald's, then the more specific genre stuff is more like uh, rallies or fucking Sonic. It's an even narrower and more bizarre view of things. Pawing through an old billboard chart is like turning over a really old rock to see all the moss and gross bugs that have grown underneath it. And turning over the rock charts is like finding another rock underneath that first rock. All the really fucked up bugs are gonna collect under there usually. There is some weird, weird shit that ends up finding its way on the charts. Like, even in a good year, some of the goofiest, goofiest stuff imaginable can find its way getting chart success. So imagine the kind of shit you find in a particularly bad year, like 1990, for example. And you know, recent times have actually had me reminiscing back to 1990 a lot. What with all these think pieces that seem to come out every few months. Is rock finally dead? Rock and roll is finally over. Blah, blah, blah. People, please, I implore you, get this into your heads. Rock is not dead. It's just not popular. Believe me, not being popular is not the same thing as being dead. People in high school and college, please learn this lesson now. You'll save yourself so many damn headaches. For the last few years, what we've been in is what I'd like to call a transitionary period. The old stuff that was popular in rock isn't really working anymore, and the next big wave that's going to come along and replace it all hasn't quite happened yet. It's why weird, non-rock-centric kind of stuff, like say, 21 Pilots or Imagine Dragons, has been able to find success over in the rock spheres. The space at the top is just kind of vacant. And believe it or not, 1990 was very much the same way. In many ways, the 90s didn't officially start until April 17th, 1991. And man, when you look back at these old charts, you can really, really see that in action. Hair metal was basically dead, but still twitching. Grunge and Alternative were certainly around, but they hadn't kicked into high gear yet, so we didn't really know what we wanted. As a result, this list is riddled with further hair metal corpsing, very weird experimental shit, and even people turning back to the old guards of rock and roll to see if they could maybe fix things. Spoiler alert, they could not. One and lift off. The top 10 worst rock hits of 1990. Long nightmare as Number 10. Walking his way to freedom. So 1990, like a lot of bland, forgettable years in music, was one where a lot of forgotten bands tend to thrive. This was the era of the one-hit wonder. You know, a lot of bands showed up, only scored one time, and then disappeared forever. Or even in some cases would score several hits on the charts, but would then disappear immediately the year after, or some very similar fate. This was the year of, wait, who? 
a lot of the bands that show up on lists like these are forgotten fairly quickly, many of them rightly so. But one band I'd say was pretty forgotten over here in the States that did not deserve to be forgotten was this little Welsh group called The Alarm. Now, if you're American, you probably don't know these guys, but they were somewhat of a bigger deal in the UK, at least from what I'm led to understand. They started out as a punk band called The Toilets. No, really. But in the early 80s, they decided to make a bunch of changes. They got a lot more ambitious and thoughtful in their song crafting, and they blossomed into a pretty fine little rock group. They would even go on to open and even tour with bands like U2 and Bob Dylan. The mid 80s were really, really kind to these guys. Then 1989 happened. The band released a record called Change, and while it's not like offensively bad or anything. This is just one of the most insanely forgettable records I've heard from this era. Which really sucks because even though this is one of their worst albums, it was one of their most successful here in the States. Again, the McDonald's principle just... This album scored three minor rock hits here in the States, and if I'm being honest, I could have gone with any of them for this particular list, but I decided to choose the more acoustically driven, kind of slow burn-ish song, Love Don't Come Easy. The guys had clearly been influenced by all that time spent touring America, so there's a much more western vibe to this record. It sounds more like they're trying to ape American trends that were going on at the time, and well, there's a, another fairly obvious influence on their sound here. Let's see if you can spot it. Love can be our witness. She is yeah, this is basically just a poor man's U2. This song in particular has a real rattle and hum vibe going for it. That was a big problem with the rock charts in 1990. It is just teeming with nobodies. So many of the bands I considered for this list, you would think I was making these bands up. You would look at these names and think like, no way these acts didn't actually exist. He's fucking with us. But no, I promise you, bands like Diving for Pearls, Lord Tracy, Havana Black, Little Caesar, Sleaze bees, for real sleaze bees. The Hooters? Okay, I have to be making that one up, right? No. Every single one of these bands not only existed in 1990, but were able to score chart success. All of the stuff I listened to, most of it at least, from bands like this, was just the most boring, meandering, NyQuil injection to the temple I've ever heard, man. As much as I hate to say it, yeah, this song from The Alarm, most songs from The Alarm in 1990, fit this description to an unfortunate T. But it isn't just the fact that it's a boring song that made me put it on here. Good lord, no. My specific reason for placing it here is because... Well... The Alarm, in actuality, they kick a lot of ass. These guys actually have a lot of great tunes in their back catalog. 68 Guns, Strength, Rain in the Summertime. These guys are pretty legit. They do have that poor man's U2 kind of thing going for them. But if you're into stuff like 80s U2 or even stuff like The Cult and other similar bands, this would be right up your alley. I'd say they do not deserve to be as forgotten as they are these days, but well, by the 90s they were putting out stuff like this and uh, I'm sorry people, this is just putting me to sleep. I mean, hell, people, by 1991, even U2 didn't sound like U2 anymore, so... Yeah, if this was the kind of stuff they were gonna make, there wasn't gonna be any room for them, once the alternative nation took over, especially. Sometimes it isn't what the thing is that makes it bad, 
it's the prospect of what could have been. The good news, though, is that the band regrouped in the 2000s, regained a decent amount of their momentum, and are actually still active to this day. Hell, the stuff I checked out from their late period is actually not too shabby either. So you know what? Hey, good on them for bouncing back, legit. But songs like these... Well, stuff like this is why they never had that U2 level of success. But hey, they carved their own path, so you know what? More power to them. Number nine. From his long nightmare as a... Okay, so next on the list is... Oh. I... I gotta admit, I, I actually kind of like this. Ooh, what is this building up to? I kind of dig what we... Yeah! <laughs> oh, God. Uh, really? Uh, really? Everyone, meet Kings of the Sun. They're a hard rock band from Sydney, Australia. Does this band happen to sound a lot like another hard rock band from Sydney, Australia? By chance? Kind of place where they cut yeah, this band, kind of like The Alarm, is what I like to call a poor man's band, whereas The Alarm are kind of a poor man's U2, these guys are most definitely a poor man's ACDC. But man, that comparison is not even slightly fair, because I mean, the alarm, they sounded a little derivative, but they had their own personality and boatloads of talent to help back that up, you know? The alarm was a kick-ass band. This? This is that Sam's Choice shit, man. This is that, oof. Well... I guess the instrumentation isn't half bad, the beats are nice and groovy, the guitars are nicely played. You know, maybe if this band weren't trying to knock off so much of the Young Brothers shtick, I could maybe give them a little bit of credit? I mean, you know, instrumentally they're fine. This has a lot more energy and pep than a lot of the dull as dishwater 90s had to offer, but A... Is that a sonic? Holy shit, this vocalist is terrible, dude. This guy cannot sing. With some people, it takes you a hot minute to tell whether they're off key or not. No, this dude straight up breaks the land speed record by fucking up the very first word that falls out of his mouth. Yeah! <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm lingering on it, but... I just can't get over this. You could not have done at least one other take of that. Yeah! Yes! Oh, yes, Daddy! What he's doing isn't even original. This is just a bad Bon Scott impression. Bon Scott had personality and swagger. The dude was a charisma bomb. This guy? Yeah, dude, look, you're not Bon Scott, and you sure as hell aren't David Lee Roth either. Please get up from off the floor, sir. That's reason number one as to why they ended up making my list. Reason number two? Well, 1990, for those of you that don't remember, was not a good year to be knocking off ACDC. You know, Thunderstruck, Money Talks, you might have heard of this one. We absolutely did not need an ACDC knockoff running around, because ACDC were still going as strong as ever. Running around doing a half-ass ACDC impression in the year of the Angus Buck was really not a good look. These guys were a quick and low blip on the charts, and frankly, they should be thankful they even got that far. Yeah. Number eight. 
from his long nightmare as a 1990 was a year where a lot of various styles and other smaller things fought for supremacy, but no one was ever definitively king of the hill. A lot of different styles and other types of rock sort of came in, but they came and went. Nothing stuck. Um, you know, there were a lot of classic rock stalwarts who came back to claim a few hits, but nobody dominated the year necessarily. Uh, there were the last dredges of hair metal kicking around. Some weird stuff. The occasional experimental goofball thing would see chart success. There were a lot of fads, but no true fashion. But you know one of the fads that was completely dead and had not a prayer of coming back by 1990? New Wave. I mean, there were a few hangers on in 1990. Robert Palmer chalked up a few rock hits this year. The Cure were still in it in a big way, if you want to count them. The new wave of new wave was trying to get started over in the UK, but yeah, you know, outside of a few exceptions, as far as like popular big heavy chart success goes, yeah, most of those bands were long past done. The Oingo Boingos and Wall of Voodoos of the world were all pretty much gone. That silly, whimsical, goofy as hell new wave, that had been passe for a very long time by 1990. We were on the cusp of Kurt Cobain and all his heroin and sadness and feelings. We didn't have time for that silly shit. And yet... This is Human Radio and their one and only chart hit, Me and Elvis. This was not a major hit. Can you tell? Frankly, I'm amazed something like this even showed up at all. I mean, look at it. Their lead singer is trying to rock an unplugged keyboard and an accordion. Uh, no disrespect meant to the accordion. Believe me, I have nothing but reverence for the legacies of Mr. Waits and Mr. Yankovic. But just listen to this song. I do not hear an accordion anywhere in this song. I don't think there is one here. In fact, I think they just gave him that because, you know, swinging and swaying the Casio all over the shit was a little too undignified. I mean, guys, this is what Dexy's Midnight Runner would be if it were a stupid joke band. And the lyrics... Well, ah, okay, I don't know about this. This might just be my personal bias edging in big time for this entry, but, well, th this song is an homage to Elvis, you know? This is a big old plate of Elvis fan worship, and, uh, I'm not the biggest Elvis fan in the world, if I can just be real with y'all. Oh, this song just loves the shit out of Elvis, man. Just, just get here, King. Get over here, King. This is the worst thing I've ever done on camera. I should not leave this in the final. T this tune is meant to be like a story song about one of Elvis's friends who followed him all throughout his life and career and watched his rise and fall and rode with him the whole way there. But it doesn't come off like that. This. This reads more like fan fiction, and particularly bad fan fiction at that. Yeah, my dad totally works at Nintendo, and he's also Elvis, and we have a space whale and a chocolate Ferrari. No big deal, no big deal. Oh god, for real? <laughs> Uh, was he blitzkrieged on painkillers then, too? Uh, maybe he shouldn't be driving if that's the case. Ah, uh, okay. Do you see what I mean now? This is that kind of Elvis fandom that, like, goes too far. I mean, yeah, Elvis, he was a hell of a performer in his day, but man, 
he had some really shitty down times too. I would not compare this motherfucker to goddamn Jesus. Do people even remember the 70s? Maybe to you lot that are more in touch with the king, this kind of thing reads as charming, but to me, look, people, all I see is... <laughs> Sounds like one of the weaker cuts from the Dumb and Dumber soundtrack. Again, maybe, maybe if this had debuted in like... 83 it would have had a chance, but stuff this unbearably cheesy and saccharine, this was way past its expiration date in 1990. I mean, fuck, even Elvis worship was way past its expiration date in 1990. The dude had been dead for 13 fucking years. Get over it, would ya? Ah, uh, this show ain't no good. Number seven. From his long nightmare as a... Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. Um, you guys are about to get really mad at me for this next pick, potentially, but... Well, okay, the list so far, it might seem like I'm picking on a bunch of the little guys. You know, these bands that, you know, didn't really amount to much, you know, weren't a big thing. Oh, well, you gotta pick on the little guy, Crash. I promise, that's not what I'm doing here. In fact, the reason they're so low on my list is because of the lack of impact they had. Everybody forgot about this stuff. But I need to remind you, good people, that... It was not just the little guys that embarrassed themselves in 1990. There were a lot of legacy acts that made it to the top of the charts with songs and records that did not deserve to be there. It speaks to how desperate we were to just have any goddamn thing be a hit. Clapton released a really milk toast album that gave him a bunch of rock hits. Billy Joel released one of his less than stellar records to more success than it frankly deserved. Hell, the band that was all over the number one spot in 1990, like, dominates the year, was ZZ Top. No, really, I'm not kidding. Look at all this. And with an album that is just... No. <sighs> It's not the worst ZZ record, but man, if you remember this album for any reason, it's because you're a big Back to the Future Part 3 fan. Look, many of the greats were far from great during this period. And not only that, holy shit, so many of them were doing awful, awful, awful fucking covers. I could have probably made an entire other top 10 vid listing some of these train wrecks. I mean, Bon Jovi did an atrocious version of The Boys Are Back in Town early in the year. The Scorpions absolutely maimed Can't Explain by The Who later on. I mean, look at this. Look at this. This is Brian Goddamn Adams doing an honest to God cover of Young Lust. Uh huh, yeah, sure you do, Prince of Thieves. It was hard as hell to pick just one bad cover to throw on this list, but I decided to not only pick the worst one I heard, but one of the most heartbreaking. Because goddammit, as much as I love, admire, and respect this artist and everything she has done for this industry, Oh my god, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts have no place covering ACDC's Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. Again, 1990 was just a bad year in general to be doing ACDC impressions, but dude, this just should not be... And like I said, I got nothing but love and respect for the Blackhearts. They are a truly era-defining band, and they deserve all the praise that they usually get. But people, this is a butchering of the original track. Just, oh. For one, Joan Jets is no Bon Scott. Thankfully, she's not trying to be. God, I can't imagine how that might have turned out. But at the same time, Jet's sultry, smoky, sexy as all hell alto super does not work with a song like this. 
on 99% of the other songs she's done, yeah, this is sex incarnate. This rules. But, like, people. It's dirty deeds done dirt cheap. It's one of the least sexy songs in rock history. This is a sinister and scuzzy song about contract killing. Hell, even in the original tune when there is implied sex, it's not at all, like, sexy. It's basically just an ad for a skeezy side gig as a male prostitute. Oh, and I do mean skeezy, too. Oof. Use protection, ladies. Though, I mean, that part is cut out of the Blackhearts version entirely. As is the bridge where, you know, Scott lists off all the ways he's gonna kill people for you. You know, this little bit. As much as I love Joan Jets, I do not think she can pull that off. But on the flip side of that coin, cutting out half the song just leaves it feeling like toothless and weak, you know? That's the biggest issue with this cover, a sincere clash of tones. This just doesn't make sense. I mean, Joan Jett, make no mistake, she is a badass woman, a very badass woman. But this song is about straight up murder. Bon Scott, look at this guy. I believe he could kill a motherfucker. Joan Jett's? Sorry, but I just do not buy that. Coming out of Miss, put another dime in the jukebox, baby. It's not like Joan Jett is a stranger to badass covers. Hell, I could see them doing almost any other ACDC song and doing it justice. Highway to Hell? I could see that. Let There Be Rock? Hell, that screams, Blackhearts. You shook me all night long? That song feels like Joan Jett wrote it. It sucks that we live in a world where Celine Dion got to that song before Joan Jett did. This is like the one ACDC song they shouldn't have touched. And again, I hate saying that about one of the best fucking artists to ever grace this industry, but it perfectly illustrates my point. Shit like this, this charted. Joan, I love ya, I respect ya, but you really should have known better than this. Number six. Whew. Um. Speaking of the greats, KISS! I haven't really had the chance to talk about KISS much on this channel, have I? Well, um... Okay, look, I'm not a KISS hater. I think they've done some good stuff here and there. They know how to put on a live show. You know, I would say they've earned their due, and they deserve a place in rock history. But people, just know that I am not a huge defender either. This band has some real, real shit in their catalog. And one era of Kiss I will not even vaguely defend is... Makeupless Kiss. In 1983, the band made the very controversial decision to finally shed the iconic makeup they've been sporting for roughly a decade in favor of finally showing us their own true faces. Their ugly, ugly faces. And during this phase, they basically became more of a glam and straight up hair metal band. I've heard some people defend this stuff, but personally, I just think most of it's tedious. I mean, KISS was never the band with the most integrity or anything, but hell, back in the day, at least they had their own identity. I mean, they were KISS, dude. You aren't gonna mistake these guys for anybody else. When they went all hair metal, they became way more generic. They were just basically following trends, and it got very, very boring. And in 1990, people, believe me, they were approaching the absolute nadir of that particular era. 
1990 was the year of Hot in the Shade, a bloated, meandering lurch of a record that's 58 goddamn minutes long and features the help of professional songwriters on every single track. Because we all know how well that always works out for genre bands on this channel now, don't we? Now, I've thrown some shade at forever on this channel in the past, but you know what, looking back on it, I guess this song isn't that bad. It's actually one of the better tunes from this era of Kiss, if you can believe that. This song has Michael Bolton smeared all over it, but you know, whatever, it's, it's harmless. It's about as good as you can ask for from something off this Kiss record. <sighs> because believe me, people, it can get worse. Hide Your Heart was a less successful song from this album. In actuality, this song was originally written by Paul Stanley for Bonnie Tyler back in 88. She released it as a single, but couldn't collect any heat off of it. So after that happened, Paul just said, screw it, and decided to record it with his band too. It saw a teensy bit more love under the Kiss banner, but it's still pretty much considered a dud. And I get why it's a cornball tune that sounds like something desmond child would write if he were trying to parody himself and again it serves as just like the perfect illustration to help showcase how much the old guard was slumming it in 1990 just slumming it up so badly for as sh schmaltzy as forever is it's got conviction it's a listenable tune. This, I, whatever, Ugh. just whatever. Ugh. It's a painfully boring song from yet another big band totally half-assing it in 1990. That alone wouldn't have landed it on my list though. No, what makes this song hit my top 10 is, well, uh, <laughs> how big of a slut the song is? Yeah, let me explain that. Okay, so this song was originally written for Bonnie Tyler, right? And then Kiss did their own version. That's two versions. Well, those aren't the only versions. There was also a version by Stanley's old bandmate. It's basically the exact same song with worse vocals. That makes three versions. There was also a version by Robin Beck. Eh, whatever, that's four. And then there's a version by Molly fucking Hatchet? Are you goddamn serious? What even is that shit? Get that shit out of here. I ain't, I ain't trying to be that. And you want to know the cherry on top for all of these songs? Every single one of them, except the Bonnie Tyler original, came out in the exact same year. The same year. I'm not kidding. While this one version of the song was on the charts, there were four other goddamn versions of it all slumming around in different neighborhoods. Fuck, people, the original version was barely two years old by that point. And here are four exact covers of a song that isn't even very good to begin with. Look, people, I'm sorry. If Bonnie Tyler and Kiss couldn't make this track work, goddamn Molly Hatchet sure as hell wasn't either. Hot in the Shade is often put towards the very bottom of most of those Kiss albums ranked lists, and yeah, trust me, I can totally see why. That makeup cannot come back on fast enough, dude. Number five. Long as a... While we're on the topic of hair metal, uh, this is something we do need to discuss because hair metal was still a thing in 1990. It was technically a thing even after Cobain came along and dropped his hydrogen bomb on things, but I mean, there was still a lot of hair metal that was charting in 1990, frankly, a lot of it. But even though it charted people, it was basically dead. 
The scene had been growing stagnant for a while now by this time regardless. The edgy, wild, and dangerous side of hair metal given to us by the likes of Motley Crue, Wasp, and Twisted Sister had been corporatized, watered down, and popified into stuff like Winger, Striper, Poison. Poison sucks, don't at me. Hair metal was going super duper soft in 1990. This was the era of the monster ballad. By 1990, hair metal had lost almost all of its edge. And if you want a terrific example of just how edgeless, toothless, and soft the genre had become, Why am I making fun of this? This is the best fucking thing ever. Enough is enough. God, even the name sounds like a parody. What the fuck? These guys had their big debut album in 1989, and this was a single released earlier in 1990. And, um... Good God, I don't want to say anything. I just want to watch this. Can we just watch this video? Oh, duty. I mean, do I really have to say much here at all? Look at this, the overwrought performance, the goofy, goofy ass costumes, the vocalist who can not sing. This is so goddamn campy, I'm amazed this didn't become a gay pride anthem accidentally. Like, I mean, how could it not? But like, even at the time, people realized how ridiculous this was. This video got a lot of mocking. It was absolutely torn to shreds by Beavis and Butthead. Glam rock just isn't what it used to be, Beavis. <laughs> this song is just absolutely gigglingly stupid. But it's also kind of a tragic entry on the list as well, because according to their former vocalist, this band was actually a power pop group who weren't trying to make hard music, but their label insisted on marketing them like a glam metal band, so this happened to them. I don't think a change in label was necessarily gonna help these guys, but you know, it still sucks to hear that. Enough's enough. A band so tacky, even Strong Bad dunked on them. Or to a lesser extent, is enough. Number four. So remember what I said earlier about how a lot of legacy acts did not necessarily bring their A-game to 1990? All right. Who remembers Little Feet? Well, you may have heard of them recently, rest in peace Mr. Barrere, but I would not at all be surprised if you hadn't. At least if you're like my age, maybe if you're a little bit older you remember these guys. I personally have zero recollection of these dudes. Apparently though they had a really good run in the 70s, so much so that Jimmy Page at one point apparently called them his favorite American band. Your parents might know about them, but chances are you probably don't. Hell, if you're familiar with them at all these days, it might be due to a very, very obscure reference to them in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, of all things. The influence these guys had, though, has certainly faded in recent years. Which is kind of a shame, because their 70s stuff is pretty decent, actually. It's got kind of an Eagles, Almond Brothers, proto-country kind of thing to it. It's like a mellower version of Skinner almost. But the biggest problem with them was their particular sound, as celebrated as it might have been, didn't yield hits. They just weren't the most chart successful band in the world. They had one album barely crack the Billboard Top 200 in the late 70s, but outside of that, they did not see major, major success. They're more of a cult hit, if you catch my drift. Uh, their lead singer had an unexpected heart attack, and that basically broke up the band. Until 1987. They decided to get back together, released a new album, and that did surprisingly well. So well, in fact, that they reissued some of their older albums shortly after that, and even they started going gold and platinum. 
you know, good for them too. Honestly, this is a cool story and a heartwarming tale of a band rising from the ashes to live again in a new era after they thought the initial success was all but gone. It's a shame the music sounds like this. Like, I'm sorry, people. I know that these guys are technically legends, but this was the kind of crap they were putting out in 1990. This is just one of the goddamn dorkiest things I've ever seen. Like, dorkier than human radio, even. Look at these guys. They look like a bunch of our dads got together and thought, Yeah, we'll show those kids how to make the cool music. Look out, son! I mean, country rock was a legit thing that tried to muscle its way onto the charts in 1990, but with stuff like this... Yeah, I'm surprised this never took off. This looks like something Tim and Eric would do for a sketch. On top of that, this track also has some... Questionable lyrics? That is a very odd way to introduce your sister to someone. And if she's a little young, what are you doing introducing her to strange men in bars? It sounds like you're pimping out your little sister, dude. Oh my god, he totally is pimping out his little sister. His underage sister, no less. Ew! Eighteen! Eighteen is too young! There is a very clear line where too young happens. There are laws where too young happens. I mean, there's a fair chance I'm being like way too overly analytical about all that. The song is coded in like slang and all the lyrics are super vague. It's uh, like something you'd hear over the radio in a lesser Smokey and the Bandit sequel. But this deep fried cornball of a song, this dorky ass thing made it all the way to number one in 1990. Number freaking one. This topped the charts. This track spent one quick week at the top and then absolutely tumbled down the charts afterwards. None of their good 70s stuff ever made it to number one, but this, this thing did. Ugh. Uh, number one. Number one is too high. Number one is way too high for this song, but... In 1990, it could happen. Number three. Ugh, I'm glad that's out of my system. Um, how about some more hair metal? You know, I don't think most people realize just how bad hair metal was getting around this time. I already mentioned the wimpifying of the genre, how it had lost its edge, and how it had become impossible to take seriously. I mean, it was always kind of hard to do that in the first place, but still, hair metal may have still charted in 1990, but even then, it was long considered a punchline. It was the new metal of its time. In 1988, Penelope Spiris released her sequel to The Decline of Western Civilization, which actually focused heavily on the glam metal and hair metal scenes. And people, this movie can be a rough watch, particularly if you're a metalhead. It's not a pseudo celebration of the scene like the first movie kinda sorta was. No, 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 no. This film is an autopsy of metal. Though it's been rumored and even confirmed in a few instances that parts of this movie were staged. If you do decide to watch this, don't take it all as like gospel. But at the time, it didn't matter. The damage was done. Some argue that this film right here was actually what definitively killed glam metal. I would disagree, though. This was more the initial shot in the chest. Hair metal didn't die with this movie, but this was where the genre began slowly and painfully bleeding out its last in a long, drawn-out, and horribly painful death. 
And if you want to know what a genre looks like when it's bleeding to death... I can't live without your love and affection. Oh, good lord, Nelson. Ugh. Their debut, After the Rain, dropped in 1990, and this was the lead single. Uh, it's not incompetently played, I'll say that much. I mean... Look, people, I'm about to say a lot of mean things about this band, but I mean, check out that riff. Say whatever you want to, but they can play. But holy shit, this is just everything laughable about hair metal all wrapped up into one neat little package. Unlike Enough's Enough, though, it doesn't even have the so bad it's good quality. This just sucks. It's got almost every wretched stereotype that people point to and laugh when they make fun of hair metal. Horrible fashion sense? Check. Nice knee-high pleather boots there, dude. Abysmal song titles and themes? Pfft, yeah, big check on there, buddy. I can't help but feel like Fallout Boy stole some inspiration from this. And embarrassing, terrible lyrics? Hoo-hoo-hoo, boy. Super check. This song is so contrary to hair metal's core ethos, or at least its ethos in the very beginning. I mean, think about it. What were some of the first biggest hair metal songs to come out? You know, shout at the devil. We're not gonna take it. Fuck like a beast. This? This is something Katy Perry would write. No, no, fuck, even she has more dignity than this. No, this is more like Lucas Graham or Louis Capaldi level. It's squirming and pitiable. And also it's apparently about Cindy Crawford, I guess. It gives the song a creepy, stalkery, kidnappy kind of vibe. I can't imagine Miss Crawford was much of a Nelson fan. And another fun little factoid I'll toss in there for you. Uh, if the name Nelson sounds weirdly familiar, it honestly should. The Nelson name does have a history in American music. These boys are in fact the twin sons of that badass, hardcore, all-American rock and roll legend, Ricky Nelson. Yeah, this guy. Their grandparents were Ozzy and Harriet, for fuck's sake. This is like if a metal band was fronted by Rod and Todd Flanders. Look, even Oakley Doakley never took it that far. 1990, the year of Nelson. Blech. <laughs> Number two. <sighs> the damn Yankees. When people mention supergroups, usually someone will immediately point to these guys as one of the worst examples of how that concept can be dreadful. Formed in 1989 by Night Ranger's Jack Blades, Styx's Tommy Shaw, future Leonard Skinner drummer Michael Cordellone, and Ted... <laughs> Fucking Nugent. Don't even get me started on this cum dribble. The damn Yankees, in the late 80s at least, seemed like a huge hit on paper. When they dropped their debut album in 1990, the consensus on that album seems to be that most people didn't get what they were expecting here. It was a weirdly ballad heavy record full of softer tunes and the like, which Given this lineup, who the hell was expecting that? I mean, who the hell wants to hear a ballad out of this shit smear? But hey, the whole southern rock thing that was trying to happen in 1990 was in full swing. Tommy Shaw still had a bunch of credibility left over from his days with Styx, and... Well, 1990 was a supernova of suck, so yeah, this album was very successful. Now, I bet you're thinking, oh boy, Crash is going to tear apart high enough. But you know what? No, I'm not. In fact, if there is a song from them that I can tolerate, it's probably this one. 
again, if only because the music video is so goddamn ridiculous and stupid, I came about this close to putting their second biggest hit from that album, Coming of Age, on this list. I really, really did. It was a tough choice between this song and the one I ended up going with eventually because... Ew! But you know what? No, I did not choose that. In fact, believe it or not, I didn't put any damn Yankees on this list. I know they would have been an easy target, and I think everyone was expecting me to here, but I don't know, people, after listening to their catalog and listening to the rest of the stuff the 90s had to offer, honestly, I just couldn't. I could not, in good conscience, put coming of age on this list. No, no, no. Not when stuff like this exists. Bonham was a band founded by one Jason Bonham. If that name sounds familiar, yes, it's that Jason Bonham, son of the legendary Led Zeppelin drummer John Bonham. In 1989, he formed a band, and in 1990, they scored a minor top 40 mainstream rock hit with this track, Wait For You. One of the band's only hits, but it did scrape its way all the way up to number 9 somehow. So I guess the big question now is, why did I pick this over Damn Yankees? Well, a few reasons, the least of which being... I mean... Listen to it. Like, this sounds like hot shit. The quality of this ancient ass music video doesn't do them any favors, but even without that, the song is just an absolute turd. It's mixed horribly, even for the time. It has some very gaudy, out of place synth string work in there, and the playing overall? Yeesh. I would at least expect, like, the drums to be good, but man, this doesn't sound like there's a bottom behind the kit, you know what I mean? Say whatever the hell you want to about the damn Yankees, at least they could play. This sounds like a really, really half-assed Led Zeppelin cover. No, honestly, I'd say it sounds even worse than that. It sounds like a Led Zeppelin karaoke version of a track. Oh, hey, speaking of lyrics, ah! Now, Coming of Age, look, that's a pretty skeezy track, but if you wanted to, I'm saying if you wanted to, you could say I'm taking too much out of context with it. It's not inherently scuzzy. The word choice on this song, it could just be taken a certain way. It's not like a blunt force, nail on the head, legally adopt a 17-year-old girl from her parents so you can fuck her kind of thing. For real, Nugent is a disgusting piece of shit. At least, at least, it's a little subtle. Wait for you, on the other hand? Hello, 911. I'd like to report a serious case of. Wait, your eyes are too wide and new? What the fuck does that mean? Is, is she a goddamn newborn? I can't get you out oh, well. Fucking who? Cry me a river. If what you're implying in this song is true, yeah, your ass better be afraid. Like, people, there's just no getting around it. This song is straight up about creeping on a kid. If nothing else, it's about a very inappropriate relationship with someone way too goddamn young for you, and it's not cool. Yeah, no. I wanted to put Coming of Age on here for similar reasons, but... When your song is making Ted Nugent look less reprehensible? Yeah, you fucked up big time, homie. I wanted to do the popular thing and slag off the damn Yankees. 
I don't know, maybe some other time, guys. But after listening back to it, hell, it ain't this bad. Ugh, man. People, this has been a long list, so... I, I don't know, how about we just blow off a little bit of steam before we hit the number one spot and just rattle off a few quick dishonorable mentions? Why not? In 1990, Old Hat's Bad Company scored a bunch of hits with a very mediocre record. One of those hits was a rough and tumble, bar fighting kind of song that sounds like it was written by a complete dweeb. You know, I almost have kind of a soft spot for this song. Hell, it might have been okay if not for this dude's voice. Ow! Ugh. Yeah, this absolutely eats. Thank God Everlasting Company would be coming along soon to reclaim that phrase. Yet again, we have a hair metal band with a frontman who cannot sing for shit. This sounds like if the Rolling Stones were being covered by Limousine. Apparently this is also an anti-censorship song as well, so... In 1984, the big anti-censorship song was We're Not Gonna Take It. In 1990, it was this. Oh my god, what is this boring grandma's funeral ass snorefest? How the hell did this get on the rock charts? I can maybe help you understand why. Recognize the lead singer? How about if I add this? Yes, that there is Dire Straits frontman and Sultan of Swing himself, Mark Knopfler. See, Dire Straits had broken up in 1988, and Mark spent 1990 doing stuff like this. Yeah. Poison sucks, don't at me. And there we have it. All that's left is... Number one. So, fair warning, even though this song has aged like cottage cheese in an air vent, there is still a very firm and devoted fan base for this particular song. Believe me, this is my extending an olive branch to you lot. Do not watch this, please. I'm begging you. If you like the song I'm about to say, just cut out of the video now. My goal with this final segment is to take this song and ruin it for you. I'm telling you, just go ahead and click away. Because people, the first half of this video, that was the main course. But this, our number one, This is dessert. There was bad hair metal, there was wussy hair metal, and then there was cherry goddamn pie. With lyrics written on the back of a pizza box in 15 minutes, this ode to confections is not only one of the lamest, cheesiest, goddamn abhorrent songs of the entire 90s, it's also just fucking disgusting. Okay, so swinging here is what they're using as like a PG term for sex. Back in 1990, you still couldn't say fuck on the radio. So these guys, yeah, that's what they were trying to do there. This is their ticket to ride, if you will. But A, Holy shit, if you're going to pick a euphemism for sex, maybe pick something that doesn't already have an inherent sexual meaning. Yeah, oops. Uh, does that mean he's sharing his girlfriend with a bunch of other strangers and shit? No, no, he's just an idiot. And B, holy shit, dude, swinging on the front porch? Like, dude, that is how the cops get called on your ass, man, for real. My god, I hope there wasn't, like, a bunch of kids waiting at the bus stop or anything like that. In the kitchen, folks don't, too busy no mo 
most people don't do that because they don't want their kitchen utensils to reek of pussy. Oh, now you've gone and pissed her off. Oh, you're as good as fuck, dude. This song is just gross. Fun fact, did you know that Much Music wouldn't air this specifically because they thought it was too sexist? Yeah, I'd say there's a fair case to be made. Ain't gonna swing with my daughter no more. You fucked his daughter on his front lawn! Yeah, you're not gonna be swinging by anytime soon! The imagery and choice of innuendo here is just really disgusting and poorly thought out. You know, like a song written about pussy in 15 minutes most likely would be. But before you people think I'm some kind of prude, let me reassure you, there is nothing wrong with a good song about pussy. Not at all. There have been some fantastic songs about pussy. I am not against songs about pussy. I mean, check this out. This, this is a good song about pussy. This, this is a great song about pussy. Hell, like 90% of Prince's catalog is about pussy. I got nothing against a good song about pussy. A song about pussy can be fantastic. Even a dirty, filthy ass song about pussy can be really good. To this day, I still defend the Bloodhound Gang's bad touch. Nothing at all wrong with a good song about pussy. It's just that this is a terrible song about pussy, y'all. Like I said, the failure is in the terminology. What is the term being used for pussy here? Sweet cherry pie. Not an uncommon thing to refer to a sexual characteristic as a sweet treat. But people... And by the way, this is your final warning to those of you with weak stomachs. I'm serious. Abandon ship now. What are some characteristics of a cherry pie? Well, it's sweet. Okay, that works. But what are some other descriptive adjectives you could assign to a cherry pie? Well, it's also uh, red. That is a thing. It's red and it's like fairly goopy and like messy. It's kind of a hot red mess, cherry pie, when you think about it. People, do I really need to spell this out for you? What is a characteristic about a vagina that could also be described as red, goopy, and messy? Do I really need to break this down for you? People, I mean just- Menstruation! 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 Menses! Your period! Odd flow! Crimson Tide! The Red Wedding! Shark Week! Chucky Blood! What flows out the pussy If you're going to talk about a woman's nether region, maybe don't compare it to a hideous red mess. Oh, man, that really makes the opening line a lot more gross now, doesn't it? Chunky! Hell, when you realize that, it makes the video like 15 times more gross too. All those red dots. This looks like the world's worst maxi pad commercial. And look, ladies, I'm not one of those, oh, periods are so gross. I shouldn't, you know, I should never. I'm not that guy. I'm not. It's a natural part of life. It is what it is. It's no fucking fun, but like 50% of the population does it. It's not something to have a huge fucking horrible complex. I mean, look at me holding these tampons. Look at me holding these tampons. Would I hold these tampons if it bothered me so goddamn much? If they had thought through these lyrics just a little bit more, just a teensy bit more, maybe the song wouldn't be as gross, but people, 
when I hear this song, I don't hear a fun, deviant little sex jam. I hear... So good, bring a tear to your eyes, sweet tear in the I think this was the final nail in hair metal's coffin. Cherry Pie proved that even the one thing the genre used to be good at doing, you know, being all edgy and in your face, wasn't possible anymore. By the time Cherry Pie came around, it showed us that man, there was no going back. So thankfully, eventually, this horrible dry spell of the early 90s would finally fade away once the alternative and grunge nations finally made their presence known. Rock never dies. It only changes. Change is a necessary part of evolution, and if something doesn't evolve, it dies. So, I don't know. Consider the 90s and even some of the slumps we've gone through in more modern times, just a lesson in evolution. Just, you know, adapting, moving along, and changing for the better. Because if we don't change, then, you know, we get stuff like this. People, thanks again for watching. My name is Crash Thompson, and I will see you in the next video. Super special thanks to Alaraf Water, Kyler Alarm, Brandon Barnfield.